Good afternoon and uh, welcome. It's wonderful to see another packed auditorium. We had two yesterday, and I think we're going to be breaking all records for lectures uh, for this exhibition. So uh, welcome to you all. Um, my name's David Bomford. I'm uh, one of the Houston curators of the exhibition, uh, Vincent van Gogh, His Life in Art. Um, let me preface my remarks by telling you that uh, immediately after this lecture, um, there is a concert over in the Beck building uh, entitled The Enduring Legacy of Music, which we copied from Ninka's title, um, uh, which is in room 109 at the Abstract Expressionist Gallery um, of music by composers that Van Gogh especially praised, uh, Beethoven in particular. Uh, it starts at 4.15 and admission is free. Now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce this afternoon's speaker, my distinguished colleague, uh, Nienke Bakker, uh, senior curator of the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam and lead curator in the Netherlands of the present exhibition. Uh, Nienke is one of the leading authorities in the world of the life and art of uh, Vincent van Gogh. Uh, and uh, she was educated in uh, the universities of Utrecht, of Leiden, and of Lille, and she joined the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam in the year 2000. And since then, she's been responsible for many important exhibitions and publications, including the exceptionally interesting uh, Van Gogh at Work of 2013, uh, both um, um, as a publication and as a beautifully uh, presented exhibition. And in particular, uh, she is one of the three scholars responsible for producing uh, in a seven-year project uh, the astonishing publication of all Van Gogh's 820 letters, both as a six-volume print edition in three languages and the stupendous online version in which every letter is translated, annotated, illustrated, and linked to other scholarly works. It's a phenomenal resource uh, that all art historians are indebted to. Uh, and it is available to everybody, to all of us, uh, free of charge at the press of a computer key. Van, Go Van Gogh Letters org, is that right? Van Gogh Letters org. You can all go away and read all 820 of them. <laughs> um, I'm delighted that Ninka has agreed to uh, present our opening day lecture, uh, which is entitled Van Gogh's Enduring Legacy. Please join me in welcoming Ninka Bakker. Thank you very much, David, for this uh, sort of introduction that makes me a bit uh, shy. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to see the exhibition uh, that we've collaborated on together and um, to see all the visitors coming in the exhibition and enjoying the art of uh, Vincent van Gogh. Um, this is, uh, I very much liked your uh, introduction yesterday when you when you explained the pronunciation of the painter's name. Um, uh, actually, well, here he's you, he's known as Van Gogh. I think I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly, but we say Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh. Um, and if I was living in the south of the Netherlands, I would say Van Gogh. So, uh, but I will I will just stick to my pronunciation, and I hope that you uh, that you uh, kind of uh, <laughs> get used to that. Um, so let me start uh, my talk. I, we, I will um, be talking about another aspect of Van Gogh's life. Uh, I will take you through his life and work, but I will um, also talk about how his reputation uh, was established in the years after his death, and uh, hence the title, His Enduring Legacy. So this is the Van Gogh we all know, the master of shimmering color and powerful brushstrokes, the passionate, tormented artist who produced an unmatched body of work in just a few years. Van Gogh's career as an artist lasted barely a decade. He was already 27 when he decided to become an artist, and, and having previously worked as a, an art dealer's clerk, a teacher, a bookseller, a missionary, and an assistant pastor. He died at the age of 37 after shooting himself. 
following a year and a half of recurring mental breakdowns. And we see him here after cutting off his ear. The exhibition here at the MFA traces the story of this extraordinary artist, presenting an overview of his life, work, and legacy. Thousands of people will come here to, to see the paintings and drawings assembled for this show, just as thousands of people are coming to the Van Gogh Museum every day to see the celebrated masterpieces. Vincent van Gogh might be world famous today, but in his own art time, his art was only known within a very narrow circle. Why and how did that change? Did he actively try to make a name for himself? And was the early publications of his letters crucial to this posthumous success? De generations of artists and fans have read those letters, and for many people, van Gogh has come to embody the myth of the suffering artist. Has his life actually become more important than his art? I'd like to begin by quoting an article that was published in February 1890, five months before Van Gogh took his own life. The article appeared in Mercure de France, which was the magazine of the symbolist movement. And in it, the young poet and art critic Albert Aurier declared Van Gogh to be one of the leaders of the French avant-garde. Following a long lyrical description of his painting and draw drawing style as, I quote, vigorous, exalted, brutal and intense, and his canvases as great dazzling walls made of crystal and sun, and this is a symbolist poet talking, uh, Aurier concluded his article in the following words. This robust and true artist, a thoroughbred with the brutal hands of a giant, the nerves of a hysterical woman, the soul of a mystic, so original and so removed from the milieu of our pitiful art of today, will he one day know the joys of rehabilitation, the repentant flatteries of fashion? Perhaps. But whatever happens, even if it became fashionable to buy his canvases, which is unlikely, <laughs> At the prices of Mr. Maisonnier's little infamies, I don't think that much sincerity could ever enter into that belated admiration of the general, general public. Vincent van Gogh is at once too simple and too subtle for the contemporary bourgeois spirit. He will never be fully understood except by his brothers, the true artists, and by the fortunate enough among the little people, the lowest social level, who have, by chance, escaped the good intentions, teachings of public education. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, this is 1890. <laughs> the terms in which Aurier presented the painter here were decisive to the formation of Van Gogh's image as a misunderstood genius, a visionary who struggled and suffered for his art at loft and lonely heights. But in fact, he was already getting some recognition, recognition in artist circles. Look at Aurier's article. Uh, he's calling him a pioneer of, of modern art. And now he's world famous. How did that come about? Let me start with the painting The Red Vineyard, now in the Pushkin Museum in Moscow. You see it on the left. Its counterpart, The Green Vineyard, is now in the exhibition. You see it there on the right. And uh, it's really. Great to see it here, actually, with a painting also from our collection belonging to the same series. Um, this red vineyard is famous for being the only painting that Van Gogh sold during his lifetime. The Belgian artist Anna Bock paid 400 francs sorry, for it in the exhibition of Levant in Brussels in 1890. So this was during Van Gogh's lifetime. She was the sister of uh, an artist that Van Gogh know, knew, uh, uh, Eugène Bock, a Belgian artist. And contrary to myth, this was not the only work that Van Gogh sold during his life, although it was the first official sale. It also went for a reasonable price. <coughs> by way of comparison, Vincent's brother, Deo, had sold a similarly sized canvas by Paul Gauguin to a collector for 600 francs a year earlier. As I said, the Red Vineyard was not the only work that Van Gogh sold. He frequently traded work with other artists, which was an effective way to establish his reputation. 
And we know from his letters that he sold a few portraits via the paint merchant Bertangui, who we see here on the left in a painting by Van Gogh. We know that he sold this portrait, which is reproduced here in black and white because we don't know where it is. Uh, this portrait of an unidentified man, he sold that through Tanguy uh, for 20 francs, which was not a lot, obviously. Uh, and Tanguy also supplied Van Gogh with paint and canvas in return of painti for paintings. On another occasion, Van Gogh traded a painting of herring, probably the one that you see on the top, uh, for a carpet in Paris. <laughs> All in all, Van Gogh must have sold or bartered around 20 paintings in this way, not including the works that he exchanged with other artists. He's also thought to have given a large number of flowers to lives to the owner of Café Le Tambourin in Paris in return for meals. This is Agostina Segatori. Um, she was the owner of the bar uh, that Van Gogh uh, often went to, and uh, they were briefly uh, uh, in a relationship. Um, and another story about these flower paintings is that he actually courted her by giving her flowers to lives. But this is Emile Bernard, uh, his artist friend, uh, perhaps making it more romantic, I don't know. Anyway, uh, these flowers to lives were then also uh, given uh, away. But still, it's not many works in total that he sold, and the vast majority of his output ended up in his brother Theo's hands when the artist died in July 1890. We see him here on the left. Following Theo's own de death, only six months later, his widow, Jo van Gogh Bonger, took responsibility for the collection, and after her, the couple's son, Vincent Willem, who later founded the Van Gogh Museum. And you see uh, Jo van Gogh Bonger on the photo in the middle, with her son, who is uh, wearing a dress which was uh, quite common at the time for little children. Uh, but this is Vincent Willem, who was named after the artist. Uh, and you also see him in the picture on the right with his wife. Uh, this is in uh, 1949. And uh, you see them at home, uh, surrounded by all the paintings that are now in the Van Gogh Museum. So you see the sunflowers, uh, the harvest, and next to Vincent Willem, who is happily smiling, and <laughs> uh, you see the self-portrait that is now in the exhibition here, and also the little landscape from Arle uh, next to the self-portrait that's also now in the exhibition. Um, so he's the founder of the museum, and he's played an immensely important role uh, in keeping the collection together. Uh, and there's an essay in the catalogue, actually, uh, for, by my colleague about, uh, about this. I can recommend it. So the situation regarding the early sales and dissemination of Van Gogh's work is a little more complex, than, therefore, than the myth would have us believe. The myth of Van Gogh as the misunderstood genius who died in poverty and sold just one painting in his entire life. He wasn't really poor either. His brother sent him mon money every month, and from 1888 onwards, when Vincent moved from Paris to Provence, Theo also paid for his canvas and paint supplies. Van Gogh had more disposable income than his postman friend in Arles, for instance, who also had a wife and four children to support. Uh, and I was really happy to see the beautiful drawing in, ex in the exhibition, which I hadn't seen. And this is a, uh, a drawing that he did after the painting that is in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, and you can see the, the, uh, the text below the, the, the image and it says, uh, uniforme gros bleu et jaune. So this is a big blue uniform with yellow. Uh, and the background is white with a very strong cobalt color. So he's explaining to a friend what the colors of the painting look like. That's why there's the little notations. Um, so Van Gogh, who was fully supported by Theo financially, he didn't have to, to sell his work in order to pay his bills although he was naturally eager for recognition and to stand on his own feet. There was also the fear that at some point Theo might no longer be able su to support him. The notion that he was poverty-stricken is partly due to Van Gogh's constant complaints in his letters that he was short of money. In reality, this had more to do with his own uh, inability to manage his budget. In 
It's nevertheless a fact that at the time of his death, Van Gogh was only known within a narrow circle. Within a few decades, however, he would become one of the best known and most expensive artists in the world and would be proclaimed the father of modern art along with Cézanne and Gauguin. More so even than those two artists, Van Gogh has always been seen as a misunderstood genius. So where does that image come from? To some extent, like the idea that he lived in poverty, it had to do with his letters. Vincent himself was influenced by the romantic notion of the peintre maudit, the artist doomed to be misunderstood. And you can also uh, hear that very clearly in uh, Aurier's uh, article that I just quoted. Writing about a review by Aurier, Van Gogh told his mother and sister, I quote, when I heard that my work was having some success and when I read that article, I was immediately afraid that I'd regret it. It's almost always the case that success is the worst thing that can happen in a painter's life. Van Gogh was highly critical of his own work and felt it wasn't good enough yet. And to his mind, Aurier's praise was misplaced. At first sight, his view of himself as unsuccessful was not entirely incorrect. His artistic career lasted just 10 years. And he was already 27 when he decided he would be wanted to become an artist. And he concentrated on drawings in the, in the, drawing in the, very, in the first few years in the hope of being able to earn a living as an illustrator. A few nice early drawings from the, sh from the show. So at first he started actually, he, he didn't start out as a painter, but he uh, started out as with the idea of becoming an illustrator. Here's four more drawings that he did a year later in 1882 in The Hague, which he made as part of a series of 12 city views. And this was a commission from his uncle and he received a couple of guilders for each drawing. So this was a first paid uh, commission that he made. Van Gogh also began to paint in 1882, initially producing landscapes in the tradition of the Hayek school and the French Barbizon school. These are nice pieces of work, but show no sign as yet as of any particular talent or originality. Van Gogh remained, it's maybe harsh to say, but a rather mediocre artist for quite a while. <laughs> Throughout his Dutch period, from 1880 to 1885, his best work hardly stood out above the average of his compatriots. And of course, he was still in his training, uh, his learning phase. The quality of his art improved considerably during his time in Paris, from 1886 to 1888. But it was only from 1888 onwards, when he settled in Arles in the south of France, that his work became genuinely inimitable and spectacular. Some examples from the show again. The fame he enjoys today rests, therefore, on the art he produced in Arles and subsequently in Saint Remy and Auvergne in the south of France. And I'm here, so you can see some uh, examples that are really fantastic in the exhibition. But what efforts did Van Gogh himself make to help establish his name? To what extent did his contemporaries have the opportunity? to see uh, his work and to form an opinion about it. Let's take a look at what Van Gogh himself thought of the progress of his career, and his letters reveal a surprisingly positive view of his own achievements. He did not consider his e earliest work works to be suitable for exhibition because he had yet to learn his trade and at that point, and he regarded his entire Dutch period as an apprenticeship. Only in 1884, when he moved to Nunen in the province of Brabant, did he first attempt to interest art dealers in his work. This was driven largely by necessity, as Theo was thinking of giving up his job as a dealer in Paris, which would have meant that he could no longer support, it and support Vincent. While in Nunen, Van Gogh produced large fully realized drawings like this, which he sent to Theo in Paris in the hope that he would be able to sell them. He had previously previously sent them to a friend, the painter Anton van Rappart, who had numerous contacts in the art world, in the Dutch art world, but without success. As far as Van Gogh himself was concerned, his career only really began with the potato eaters in 1885. 
This was the first work he did not describe as a study, but as a fully fledged painting, the masterpiece he hoped that would establish his name both artistically and commercially. He drew inspiration for this and other works in the same period from the example of the French peasant painter Jean-François Mille. What Van Gogh wanted was, and I quote, that people get the idea that these folk who are eating their potatoes by the light of their little lamp have tilled the earth themselves with these hands they are putting in the dish, and so it speaks of manual labor, and that they have thus honestly earned their food. I wanted to give the idea of a wholly different way of life from our civilized people. So I certainly don't want everyone just to admire it or approve of it without knowing why. The potato eater was followed by somewhat less ambitious but equally accomplished paintings like the old church tower that is in the exhibition to the left, which he sent to Theo in Paris along with the potato eaters and the poplars near Nunem, which is now in Rotterdam in the Museum Boymans from Beuningen. And the latter is one of his final Dutch works in which you can see what he had learned from his visit to the newly opened Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam in October 1885, and namely the loose brushworks of Rembrandt and Hals. He eventually moved to Paris in 1886 in the hope of establishing his name with his dark art in the Dutch tradition, a hope that was not destined to be fulfilled. In the French capital, Van Gogh came across modern art for the first time in the shape of Impressionism and Pointillism. And it can't have taken him long to realize that he had rather wasted his apprenticeship uh, in the Netherlands, getting to grips with a palette of colors that, are now, that were now uh, seeming old fashioned. He decided he would have to continue his studies. He wasn't yet ready to establish himself as a modern artist. Van Gogh produced numerous color studies in Paris and works in which he experimented with brushwork and impasto, as you can see here in these three paintings that are in the exhibition. He closely observed the work of other artists in museums and galleries, at exhibitions and in French studios. The immense development of Van Gogh's work in Paris is clearly apparent in this large painting at the top from the summer of 1887. It's a highly individual interpretation of pointillism. It's much freer in its technique than in than Seurat and Signac advocated. Van Gogh had seen Seurat's La Grande Jatte, which you can see here uh, in, on the screen, at the Impressionist exhibition, where it caused an immense stir. And he exhibited his own painting of a park, which is on the top, in the foyer of the Théâtre Libre in Montmartre where works by Seurat and Signac were also on display. This was a canvas, in other words, with which he wanted to position himself within the avant-garde. Japanese printmaking was another crucial influence on Van Gogh in this period. Like many artists, he was fascinated by what to Western eyes were the unusual compositions and color schemes of these prints, of which he acquired a large collection in Paris. He painted a copy of the print that you can see upper, uh, upper right, uh, which is now in the Van Gogh Museum. And the crosswise brush strokes that you see, it's not a very good image, but in the image of, on the left, um, the crosswise brush strokes he used in the background of his works in this period reflect the crumpled surf surface of crepon, which is uh, which are Japanese prints on crepe paper. So he's, he was very much influenced by this uh, new, for him, new art. And my colleague Louis van Tobar is actually going to give a le lecture on that subject uh, in somewhere in the coming months. So you have to come and uh, listen to him because he knows all about this topic. We've done a big exhibition about it last year. Uh, van Gogh himself selected this painting, the picture on the right, sorry, left, um, which he called Parisian Novels, as his contribution to the first official exhibition in which he took part. And it was the exhibition of the artist association Les Indépendants in Paris in 1888. He himself considered it one of his most modern works. It was only in Arles, where Van Gogh moved in 1888, that he believed his apprenticeship to be complete. The time had now come to start, to start de development, ooh, 
The time had now come to start developing his career, and he set himself to the goal of producing works with which he could position himself in the market. His plan was to stage an exhibition in 1889, consisting of 30, and he later said 50, paintings, which would form a coherent ensemble. Van Gogh assumed that his artist uh, avant-garde friends like uh, Paul Gauguin, uh, Émile Bernard, and Georges Seurat would also present important works at this show, which would be held just as all eyes were focusing on Paris because of the 1889 World Exhibition. It would be the ideal opportunity to show what he was capable of. And with this I idea in mind, he created the works in Arles that we now considered, consider to be the best of his career such as the bedroom and the harvest, and of course the sunflowers. And these uh, works all were part of the decoration that he made for his house in Arles, um, hanging the pictures in his house, but it was also an ensemble that one day he was hoping to exhibit, and it was very important to exhibit them together because they were complementing and uh, reinforcing each other. Van Gogh felt that these and other works ought to be kept together with a view to establishing his reputation in due course. And so he asked Theo not to sell anything prematurely. The paintings needed to be presented as an ensemble in order to I intensify one another. It's Van Gogh's tragedy that he was never able to achieve the exhibition of his very best work that he dreamed of. His optimism and self-confidence were badly shaken by the first signs of mental illness, the tragic outcome of which is well known. He suffered a breakdown in December 1888, in which he cut off his ear and was admitted to hospital. Paul Gauguin, with whom he had been living and working for the previous two months at the Yellow House in Arles, returned to Paris. Van Gogh's dream of the studio of the South, in which like-minded minded artists could collaborate, evaporated and the recurring psychotic, psychotic episodes that uh, he suffered left him with no choice but to seek admission in, in an asylum. He arrived at the mental hospital of saint Remy at the beginning of May 1889 and he would remain there for a year. Plagued by loneliness and illness, it became increasingly difficult for him to keep hold of his lofty ambitions of the previous year. Although he enjoyed highly productive periods at Saint Remy and attained immense artistic heights, a few other works from this period, his belief that he would play a significant role in modern art steadily waned. And when he moved to Auvergne near Paris in May 1890, he wrote to, to Theo, I quote, I feel a failure. That is it, that's it as, it as regards me. I feel that that's the fate I'm accepting and which won't change anymore. Two months later, he committed suicide. In the meantime, contemporaries had their first opportunity to discover Van Gogh's best work, what he'd done since 1887, because that was the last time that works by him were shown uh, in Paris. And they could see his work at the exhibition of the artist society Levant in Brussels in 1890. Vincent was invited to take part and he selected six paintings, including two versions of his sunflowers. And these paintings are now in the National Gallery in London and in the Neue Pinakothek in Munich. And he also exhibited the truly magnificent Orchard in Blossom, now also in Munich. And this is very significant, so he's choosing the works and this says a lot about what he considered his best paintings. Two paintings had previously been shown in the exhibition of Les Indépendants in Paris in 1889, Starry Night, now at the Musée d'Orsay on the left, and the irises from uh, which are now in the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. And the irises were actually picked by Theo, so he was the one who decided to include that canvas. The following year, Theo selected 10 works for the exhibition, also of the Indépendant, including The Ravine, which is now in Boston on the left, and Sunrise, in, now in a private collection. And this was in February 1890, so a few uh, months before Vincent died. And there was also another version of The Sunflower then exhibited. 
All in all, then, living far away from Paris, Van Gogh only gave his contemporaries three opportunities to discover his finest work, which he produced in the final two and a half years of his life. A total, to be precise, of 18 works. And that's not many, even if we allow for the fact that Van Gogh's late work could also be seen at Tanguy's paint store and at Theo's home. Tanguy's store was only known to a small group of young artists and critics. However, while the works at Theo's place were obviously accessible only to acquaintances and friends. So Van Gogh certainly was not misunderstood then. It was simply that hardly anyone knew him beyond his own circle of like-minded artist friends. Within that narrow circle, however, his extraordinary talent was quickly accepted, which says more about his reputation than the limited number of paintings that he sold. Van Gogh's canvases from Arle and Saint-Rémy were something entirely new, and his colleague could see that. His colleagues could see that. According to Camille Pissarro and Paul Gauguin, his work was the sensation of the Independent exhibition in 1890, and several of his fellow artists hoped to acquire the painting that you can see on the left, the Ravine, which was shown there. Gauguin already owned a work by Van Gogh, as did Amy Bernard. Actually, Amy Bernard had many works by, uh, by Vincent in his possession. And Edgar Degas later bought an 1887 still life of sunflowers. While Rodin, the famous sculptor, acquired the marvelous portrait of Tanguy, this painting, for his collection in 18, 1894. And it's still in the Musée Rodin in Paris. This peer recognition occurred in parallel with the earliest signs of critical recognition. The first glowing review of Van Gogh's work was published, as you have heard, in 1890, the previous quoted article by Aurier, whom Amy Bernard had encouraged to go see and Van Gogh's work at Theo's house. This remarkably rapid progress toward fame was only accelerated by Van Gogh's early and dramatic death. The myth of the misunderstood genius, which Aurier had already initiated, now became firmly established. Following the first publication of Van Gogh's letters by Amy Bernard, uh, in the magazine Mercure de France in 1892, the details of Vincent's tragic life and his own romantic vision of what it was to be an artist added, added the finishing touches. So these are letters uh, to different artists. In the middle, you, you see a letter to Theo. Uh, on the left is a letter to Amy Bernard, and on the right, a letter to Paul Gauguin. And Bernard published the letters, and then later on, uh, more letters were published. But these were absolutely crucial to, to Van Gogh's uh, uh, reputation. And this was already in 1892, so two years after he died. And uh, as David said, you can read them all online. I put the web address there. So henceforward, that life that was now uh, known through his letters, came to be viewed by critics and artists alike as the embodiment of the prophetic artist who was so misunderstood that su suicide offered the only way out. It's odd that Van Gogh's fame among the youngest generation of French artists in the 1890s did not translate immediately into success in the art market. It was not until the beginning of the 20th century that his achievement would be recognized by the art trade. Although the Paris dealer Ambroise Vollard had purchased work by Van Gogh in the 1890s and had staged several exhibitions of his as his gallery, the anticipated success failed to materialize and he sold everything off, prematurely, as he la later noted with regret. <laughs> so this kind of counterintuitive pattern uh, reflected Theo's unexpected death in 1891 which, unlike the artist's own death, had negative repercussions for Van Gogh's legacy. One such disadvantage was the fact that Theo's widow, Jo van Gogh Bonger, moved back to the Netherlands, taking the collection with her. Emile Bernard tried to persuade her that it would be better to leave Van Gogh's work in France, as he had already enjoyed a certain reputation there, on which they could build. But Jo decided to go back to the Netherlands. Lacking her husband's contacts, she failed to find a good representative among the French art dealers, now that she was no longer in the country. 
it was not until the beginning of the 20th century that Jo secured uh, an appropriate representative for Van Gogh's work in the shape of the German art dealer Paul Kassirer. A large number of exhibitions now cemented Van Gogh's rapidly growing fame, at which point prominent collectors began to show an increasing interest in his work. But all the same, it took longer for Van Gogh's reputation to take off in France than would have other otherwise have been the case. I'll just have a sip of water. For the time being, Van Gogh's reputation in France was limited there to recognition, recognition on the part of fellow artists. In the Netherlands, by contrast, Van Gogh's fame grew rapidly, aided significantly by Jo's encouragement of exhibitions devoted to his work. With the assistance of the artists Jan Torop and Richard Roland Holst, she staged the first retrospective of Van Gogh's work in Amsterdam in 1891. So one year after the, the death of the artist. Art dealers began to show an interest and she sold the first work, works from the collection. A milestone on the road towards wider recognition came when the first works by Van Gogh found their way into museum collections. Although the Dutch collector Hidden Nijland donated an early drawing to the Museum Boymans van Beuningen in Rotterdam in 1899, on the left here, this wasn't the first museum to acquire a Van Gogh. That honor goes to the Nation National Museum in Oslo, Norway, which had purchased a marvelous drawing from Arle, which you see on the right, already in 1893, so just three years after the artist's death. But these were one-offs, and the monetary value of Van Gogh's work also remained, uh, remained limited in the 1890s. This all changed around the turn of the century, when Van Vincent's art began to increase rapidly in value, driven by dealers who had seen the prices commanded by the Impressionists rise spectacular in the 90s. They now saw an opportunity of achieving something similar with the post-Impressionists, including Van Gogh, whose work they began to exhibit and promote on the same footing as more established art. The first paintings by Van Gogh found their way into a museum in 1903. Boymans in Rot Rotterdam was gifted Poplars near Nunen, which we've seen before, it's on the top left. Uh, it was gifted by the friends of the museum, so they didn't buy it, but it was a gift. Um, and the Finnish National, Gallery, N Finnish National Museum in Helsinki acquired one of Van Gogh's final landscapes from Auvergne. It's quite a spectacular picture, it's on the right, top right. The artist association, the secession in Vienna, donated a landscape from the same period to the Österreichische Staatsgalerie in Vienna. And you can see it here, uh, the big landscape from the last period of his life. The collector Karl Osthaus acquired the Reaper for the museum he opened in Hagen, Germany in 1902, as well as the portrait of Armand Roulin, who is the son of the postman, which we've seen. And in 1911, the Kunsthalle Bremen purchased a fine landscape from saint Remy, which you can see bottom right, and a year later, the Folkwang Museum in Essen acquired the quay with sand barges from Arle, which had belonged to Emile Bernard. So these acquisitions, as acquisitions marked the beginning of Van Gogh's posthumous triumph in Germany, where his reputation was higher at first than it was in neighboring countries. The art dealer Paul Kassirer paid the, paved the way for this by organizing several exhibitions of work from Jo van Gogh's Bonger collection, van Gogh Bonger's collection. And these are two magnificent, magnificent works in the exhibition uh, were sold to, by Jo to Paul Kossierer, to this German art dealer, uh, in 1905-1906, who then sold them on to collectors. The German interest in Van Gogh should also be viewed in light of the modern art of the period, in which the German expressionists had proclaimed Van Gogh as their great example. And prior to that, the influential art critic Julius Meyer Greve had already assigned a central role to Van Gogh as the father of modern art, along with Suzanne Seurat and Gauguin in his 1904 History of the Development of Modern Art. It can hardly be a coincidence that in 1905, a year after that book was published, Jo van Gogh Bonger decided to organize another Van Gogh retrospective, 
the first since 19, 1891, and this time at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. Even though her collection was located in the Netherlands, Dutch museums, like their French counterparts, showed much less interest in Van Gogh than the German museums did. The Rijksmuseum, that, which is our national museum, exhibited selected works from Jo's collection in 1908-1909, but beyond the two drawings donated by Jo and Hidde Nijland, who was a collector in the Netherlands, it clearly, the, the Rijksmuseum clearly didn't feel any need to actively acquire works by Van Gogh. For its part, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam did not begin to acquire Van Gogh's until long after the German museums. And uh, they acquired, uh, they were donated actually a beautiful Parisian watercolor uh, at the top and a painting, a large painting from the same period, uh, which you can see at the bottom. And it, that's actually one of the paintings that Van Gogh exhibited already in 1887 in Paris. So it was also one of his, uh, the pictures that he was particularly proud of. And the still life also from the Paris period. Uh, to be seen on the right. And all these three works were acquired between 1912 and 1918. In that same period, Helene Kruder Muller was buying many works by Van Gogh. And she started buying uh, in 1912, her first acquisition being one of the paintings of La Berceuse. Um, and there's five versions of this famous portrait. Um, and she was the wife of the postman. Uh, woman, woman rocking the cradle, as Van Gogh called it. As you can see, uh, to the right of her chair, you see the inscription La Berceuse. It was a very, very important portrait for Van Gogh. So the Krulle uh, uh, collection, the Krulle Muller collection, eventually consisted of 18, 88 paintings and over 180 works on paper by the artist, making it the second largest collection of his work, works in the, in the world. And it's now housed in the Krulle Muller Museum and you can see many of the works uh, here now. Uh, and there's also an essay in the catalog about this, uh, about Helene Krulle Muller and her uh, acquisitions. So around this time, 1912, 1918, prices had co risen considerably. In 1914, Jo van Gogh Bonger published the correspondence between Vincent and his brother Theo, and that was a move that brought van Gogh international fame. His recognition was no longer limited to artist circles, like artists, critics, and important collectors. He was also embraced now by the general public, and from that moment on, there would be no longer be any limits to his fame. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ninka, very much. Um, Ninka will be down here for a few minutes if uh, anybody wants to ask her any questions. But meanwhile, don't forget the concert over in the Beck Building in the Abstract Expressionist Gallery. But thank you again. <laughs>